Yeah. Okay. So, firstly, from from our perspective, um, this this is an extremely exciting market, right? Um, compact. Um, and annual growth rate of uh, compound annual growth rate of thirty percent uh, is the sort of CAGR that people are talking about in this market. Now, what what that does is a few things. Firstly, it gets a whole bunch of contractors pretty excited about having a piece of this market. Right. So, one of the first things we saw in the counter drone market was people, I would say, calling out the woodwork with their pet technologies that were guaranteed to solve your problem. Okay. And there's a lot of them about. Uh, and I, I take the point that. Um, a lot of equipment doesn't perform as advertised. And I think in the first two or three years when this market started to get interesting, there was a lot of technology out there, a lot of confusion amongst um, uh, customers and, and stakeholders in this market as to what would really solve their problem. And a lot of purchases, which to be fair, resulted in low customer satisfaction. Okay, there was there was a, I, I don't know if you guys saw the, uh, the news in the UK after Gatwick, but every morning, every evening on the morning and evening news, there was a new contractor on the on the on the on the TV with, a, with their own version of some kind of gun that would have solved the whole problem, and everyone could have gone back to going on their on their holidays. Right? It, it was it was a little crazy. It, it it's good to see the market settling down. A lot of those early people have been weeded out, and and uh, the customer um, insight into the problem and how to set requirements and how to select equipment has really grown massively in the last few years. And a lot of the people with those types of equipments that were pretending it could solve the problem have thankfully gone away. And we're now settling into a more mature market where customers and providers of technology alike are, are talking similar languages and starting to understand how to work together, which is great. Um, I would say here, you know, that, that there, there is no silver bullet solution. That's coming from somebody who has solutions in this space. Uh, and I take the point that was made in an earlier brief about the fact that you know, one system isn't going to be the thing that you take to every event. Um, there's going to be a different layering of technologies, a different layering of solutions to meet particular events. And, and no two customers, in my uh, experience, have similar requirements. Okay. And the final point, the legislation and I would say CONOPS, operational concept, uh, concepts of operation. Uh, Martin said TTPs, yeah, that's lagging behind. I think that 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 is where we need to put some effort, as you'll hopefully see in the brief. Um, I decided to, to show this problem of how do you protect uh, an operation, now, whether that's an airport or a prison or a royal palace or whatever you're trying to protect uh, from drones. What does that operation look like on the ground at the point at which you're trying to make a decision about how to mitigate that risk? An absolutely valid point. The risk isn't the drone. The risk is the risk to your operations. If you're a national airport or an international airport, the risk is you have to shut a runway and lose millions of dollars and millions of pounds. Uh, the Gatwick incident is suggested to be 50, 100, 150 million pounds was lost in that. So that's the risk. It's not the drone itself. Okay. Um, and I would start at the top of the OODA loop. Uh, anyone who's involved in military is probably familiar with an OODA loop. Um, observe to me as an engineer is one of the critical things. Unless you have that situational awareness, unless you absolutely understand what is in the air, if there's something in the air, is it carrying a payload? Exactly where is it flying? What's its trajectory? What's its speed? Is it heading for you? really everything else that comes beyond that is going to be very tricky to do right and, and there's anecdotes from gatwick there was a police commissioner on the on the tv two or three days after gatwick saying we still don't even know if there was a drone right so you can shut down an international airport by making a phone call you don't even need a drone right so that situational awareness piece is absolutely critical that observation piece is there a drone what type is it what is it doing is it a threat to our operations the orient piece or orient piece then is really referring to your local ttps Yes, there is a drone. This is what it's carrying. It's heading in this direction. What are our procedures say? What does our training say? How are we going to react to that? Okay. And then there's the decision piece. Okay. What are we going to do about it? It may be we just do nothing because it's 600 meters off the runway. It's not a threat. It's just observing. It's not really going to threaten anything. Okay. Let's continue landing aircraft until we see something else happen. And if it moves in the wrong direction, you may decide to do nothing. Right. And then finally, there's the action, the act piece. Uh, and I take Matthew's point, it, it could just be, you know, shut the blinds, close the window, turn off Wi-Fi, uh, blow a whistle, take people out of an exercise yard. It doesn't need jamming, right? If you jam it, you have a health and safety issue that it could fall out of the sky. If you jam it, you've probably lost your opportunity to go and interdict the pilot. You could let it fly for 20 minutes. They don't last long on batteries. So let it fly, go and interdict the pilot, leave it flying as long as you're not causing a problem. There's a whole bunch of actions that can be taken before you decide to take RF jamming or kinetic uh, action to take the drone out of the sky, which again has uh, pretty significant health and safety implications. Um, and then around that, I would say 
And this is why I didn't want to talk about equipment today. The equipment only really can give you the observe piece and a little piece of the act piece here. It's not the whole problem at all. Okay, so just like other markets, it gets saturated with uh, people trying to sell equipment. It becomes about equipment. That's not the half of it, as you can see on the diagram. Okay, the equipment gives you the observe. It can give you situation awareness if it's well designed. It can take offensive action if you decide that you need to disable the drone. But all of the other acts are nothing to do with equipment. They're to do with procedures. Okay, and so this processes and procedures piece, TTPs, I take Martin's point, evidence and intelligence, their capability alone isn't enough. It is about TTPs and CONOPs and having all of that in place to make sure you have an effective and resilient counter drone operation, not just a piece of equipment that you happen to bought from somebody. Okay. Um, I think there's a disproportionate amount of excitement around the ACT piece because jammers are cool. And if you search counter drone on Google and choose images, you're going to see every single image has got some kind of gun or RF thing and someone claiming it does everything. Again, that is only on this diagram 25% of the problem. I would suggest it's even less than that, right? Um, so I, I don't think there should be as much uh, effort and focus on this part of the counter drone problem, but that's where a lot of the, the focus is. Um, again, I've said it already. I think the equipment piece is only a part of the issue here. There is, for good reason, a significant amount of test and evaluate activity to make sure the equipment does its, does what it said it should. I think that's as a result of a very volatile early market where there was a lot of equipment that professed to do things that it couldn't do. And the test and evaluation piece has become necessary to weed out equipment that won't do what it's supposed to. Absolutely important piece, but again, very equipment centric uh, and not really dealing with the TTPs and the processes and procedures which I think really is where we need to invest some time and effort to make sure that people understand how to have a resilient counter drone operation or even a resilient operation for a critical national infrastructure site that happens to include a counter drone capability. And, and, and all markets do this. Everyone becomes fixated on the market and the equipment. Let's go buy some equipment. And this sort of stuff lags behind a little bit. Um, this is a chart from a, a brief I've given a few times. I think that there is a bit of confusion about what technologies can do and where they fit in. So ignoring the, the background colors for a moment, I, I would start with the threat itself and threat assessment is absolutely critical here. Uh, threats range from a 15 year old kid with a Christmas present who happens to stray too close to a national facility all the way to state sponsored activity, which uh, is a lot more serious. OK, now I would suggest that the type of drones that are involved in this more benign and nuisance area are almost certainly off the shelf, unmodified, probably behave like standard drones, have standard communication signals that drones use. And therefore, they're able to be um, dealt with or intercepted or detected and tracked by a number of different technologies. And I, I won't get into all the details, but radar, radar and, uh, and communications intercept, RF uh, direction finding sensors, are equally capable against these types of drones. Okay, Imagery is an extremely capable uh, sensor, but needs to be set on to a drone. So it requires something to set it on in 3D space. And audio, I think, is, is a bit of a challenging uh, primary sense of a counter drone system that can actually add some utility, but needs to be in a pretty benign environment to work. Back to a point that was made earlier, is it really viable in an international airport? The interesting position, uh, or the interesting situation arises here when things get more modified and bespoke. I think the 1% of threats that you really care about are gonna look like nothing you've ever seen before. Okay, it's extremely difficult to mitigate that threat but recognizing that it won't behave like normal things can help you develop resilient processes to deal with it. Okay, and back at the bottom end here, so you can legislate for some of this stuff. You can put up signs that say no drone fly zone. You can put uh, geofencing on drones, but that's not gonna at all deter the people over here that wanna cause some, uh, some issues for your operations. Okay. Um, I'm not gonna go into all of this diagram, but everything I've discussed so far just fits into the here and now of how you deal with an event, okay? And again, I think there's a whole bunch of pre-event activities that you need to make sure you have in place. A full understanding of the risk that you're trying to mitigate, not the drone itself. How you forecast the severity of that and how often it might happen. Um, the minimum viable protection. Okay, what does it mean to have protection in place and how do you deal with that? And then the post-event. What do we learn from that? How do we cover? And this is the, the really the resilience of the operation that you're running. You've had an event like Gatwick. How many days did you have to shut your airport for before you could reopen? Okay, how quickly can you move your planes around? How can you get that operation back up and running and restore the 50, 100 million pounds that you would otherwise lose? So there's a, there's a huge piece around here, which is nothing to do with equipment. It's the TTPs and the CONOPs that uh, Martin mentioned. Uh, and within the equipment piece in here, 
see how small it's become now when you look at the whole problem of how you build a resilient operation. Uh, finally, I just thought it was worth reminding us that we, we've been in this sort of situation before in this type of market with, with uh, improvised explosive devices. Okay, um, I won't read through the table in the bottom left here, but there's a huge amount of similarity between the speed and the dynamicism at which the threat can evolve and which people can modify the threat to turn it into a weapon and the relatively slow rate at which we can accommodate that with our research programs, development programs, signing off equipment, testing equipment, uh, whether I can uh, get a license to jam or not. That takes months, if not years. It can take me six months to get a CE mark on a piece of equipment. Uh, and drones can be modified and turned into weapons in, in hours. Okay, so I think the conventional way that we, we do development and we procure equipment, uh, just like the IED threat, are probably less appropriate to this type of improvised threat that can be uh, developed very, very quickly. Um, left of bang was, was something that was talked about with IEDs, you know. I was talking about the event just a moment ago and what you do pre-event and post-event. I think left a bang in IED space was about how do we get into the development cycle of the people developing IEDs? Where are they getting their explosives from? Where are they getting their mobile phones from? Where are the factories where they're developing the, the threats? So getting left a bang, by the time you get to the point where that drone is on the way to your operation carrying explosives, it's probably too late unless you have an extremely capable set of processes, procedures and equipment on board to deal with it. So how do we get ahead of that? Uh, and stop people from being able to develop them in, in the first place. So I think, uh, you know, the, the final point here I have is that, that, that there's a whole bunch to do, which is outside equipment. There's even more to do if you consider that, you know, there's, there's, there's too much real focus on, on the jamming piece right now. Uh, and I think we can learn some lessons from the IED and counter IED space from several years ago. Thank you.